Hey guys, Neurocal MD here. Today I'm going to talk about the pros and cons of neurology for those of you who are interested in pursuing the field. I've been asked this question by many high school and medical students throughout my career who are interested in possibly pursuing neurology, so I thought, hey, why not make a video about it? I'm going to be referring to my notes, so that's why I'm like looking to the side, I'm glancing at my computer just to make sure I cover everything. I wanted to talk about the cons first to get that out of the way, but in my opinion, the positive aspects of neurology far outweigh the negatives, so please be sure to stick around for the latter half of the video. The first con about practicing neurology is that some neurological disorders are devastating to manage. It can be disheartening to see your patients suffer so much and not be able to cure them. Some examples of devastating disorders that we manage include pediatric neurological cases, for example, severe epilepsy, traumatic brain injury from non-accidental trauma, aka shaken baby syndrome, severe genetic disorders and hypoxic brain injury or lack of oxygenation to the brain which causes brain injury from near drowning experiences or choking, for instance, choking on food like nuts or grapes. These cases are particularly devastating in my eyes because the children that are affected by these diseases will never grow up to live normal adult lives. Other examples of devastating diseases that neurologists treat include amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, this involves degeneration of the neuromuscular system, which results in progressive weakness and ultimately death, usually from respiratory failure because your breathing mus muscles are so weak that um, you can't breathe or your uh, oropharyngeal muscles are so weak that you keep choking on food and you develop some sort of aspiration pneumonia and then die. Other examples include dementia and severely debilitating strokes. But trust me, there are other neurological disorders which are not devastating. They are completely manageable and they're very rewarding to treat because they lead to drastic improvement in quality of life for the patients that you take care of. Please stick around for the second half of the video because I'll be talking about these disorders as well. The second aspect of neurology that isn't so rewarding involves the psychiatric overlay Many patients who have neurological disorders also have overlying psychiatric disorders, whether it's from the stress of the neurological disease or the actual disease, the neurological disease causing psychiatric disease because psychiatric function and neurological function both come from the brain. They all come from the same the same organ, right? So the secondary psychological consequences of neurological disease can be difficult to co-manage with the neurological disease itself. The third and final con of neurology is that a number of patients with neurological disorders have cognitive impairment and that makes it very difficult for them to follow through with treatment, whether it means taking, remembering to take their medicines or following through with a specific therapy that I recommended. Many patients have family and friends support that can help them manage their medicines or take them to physical therapy appointments, but there are a number of patients who don't have any support. While editing this video, I realized I left out an important con of practicing neurology, and I thought it was way too important to leave out. Possibly one of the most frustrating negative aspects of practicing neurology in the current times is the expensive cost of many treatments and medications for neurological disorders. The cost for medications in this field has steeply risen over the past 20 years. For instance, first-generation disease-modifying therapies for multiple sclerosis used to cost about eight to $11,000 per year. Now the same treatment runs for $60,000 per year. So how can patients, especially if they're uninsured, pay for this? Many times we can apply for a grant funded by pharmaceutical companies to help the patient afford the medication. However, if the patient makes more than a certain amount of money per year, which actually isn't a lot, they won't qualify. 
Also, let's say a neurologist feels a certain expensive medication would benefit a patient. It's not uncommon for the patient's insurer, especially if the patient has Medicare or Medicaid, to require that an alternative, less expensive medication is tried, regardless of whether the physician doesn't believe this alternative to be the appropriate direction of management for the patient. The latter point I made applies to pretty much all fields within medicine, not just neurology. So you're gonna have to deal with this regardless of what specialty you enter. So whatever field you end up pursuing, ensure that the ultimate practice you decide to work in has someone, whether it's a social worker or some sort of manager, whose role it is to specifically help your patients obtain the treatment that you recommend regardless of cost. Honestly, those are the only three major cons that I can think of with regards to the field of neurology. Um, They are big ones, so think hard about how you're going to balance your life with positive things and make sure you have at least one hobby and eat right and take care of yourself so that you can be strong for your patients. Let's talk about the pros of neurology. Okay, I'm really excited about this because I think the pros far outweigh the cons. Number one, although neurologists treat a lot of devastating brain disorders, there are a lot of brain disorders that are very treatable, very manageable. I'll give you a few examples. People with debilitating migraines, once you put them on the appropriate cocktail or medication regimen, they can become headache-free and live life without those debilitating headaches. Another example is Parkinson's disease. Parkinson's disease is not curable, but very manageable disorder, which um, can be treated. Neurologists can prescribe medications that can dramatically improve quality of life, can dramatically improve the tremors associated with Parkinson's disease, the balance problems associated with Parkinson's disease. Uh, Medications can do that. We can also implant deep brain stimulators for patients with Parkinson's disease, which can significantly improve their quality of life. And then another example, the final example I wanted to save best for last is involves my area of my specialty, and that is epilepsy. Epilepsy is a brain disorder in which a person is predisposed to having seizures. So people with seizures have are severely debilitated if those seizures are not treated. People can't drive. People who have seizures are scared of going out in public because they don't want to have a seizure in front of people. So the neurologist not only gets to diagnose those seizures and help the patient figure out what is going on in their brain to cause their experience, their sometimes frightening experience, but then they get to give them a medication that completely stops their seizures most of the time so that they can go on to live life like a normal adult. They can start driving, they don't have to be scared to go out in public. So that has been one of the most rewarding parts of my career is taking care of patients with seizure disorders because obviously that's my specialty but also it's a very treatable disease. So another positive aspect of neurology is the ability to perform procedures. I am someone who really enjoys working with my hands. I considered entering a surgical field. A surgical specialty just wasn't the right fit for me when it came to to work-life balance. Neurology was better for me not only because it was really cerebral, which is another pro that I'm going to talk about next, but it also offered the ability to perform procedures. So here are a few examples of the procedures that a neurologist performs. Lumbar punctures, in which a needle is placed between the vertebrae and the lumbar spine into the spinal canal, and cerebral spinal fluid is collected and tested for certain diseases like bacterial infections, viral infections, multiple sclerosis, among other diseases. Another procedure that neurologists get to perform are nerve conduction studies and electromyelograms or EMGs. These studies test for pathology in the nerves or muscles. EEGs or electroencephalograms are also 
a common procedure that neurologists perform. So EEGs are brainwave studies in which a patient's brainwaves are recorded and the neurologists read the brainwaves to look for any evidence of seizure activity or cerebral dysfunction. An EEG technologist is actually the one that performs the procedure by gluing electrodes to the scalp and then connecting them to a machine, connecting the electrodes to a machine so that it records the brainwaves. The brainwaves are downloaded and then the neurologist will read those brainwaves. Another procedure that neurologists commonly do are nerve blocks and Botox. Nerve blocks are usually performed for patients who are in pain. Usually it's headache pain, different types of headaches. A common example of a nerve block that I perform is the occipital nerve block. Patients with occipital headaches will have a headache that begins at the base of the skull and then radiates to the crown of the head. This is usually caused by inflammation, irritation of the occipital nerves that actually exit from below the skull and then wrap around the head. So if you inject the base of the skull with pain numbing medication, you can almost immediately stop these patient, many patients' headaches. Those are just a few examples of uh, the procedures that a neurologist gets to perform. Another positive aspect of neurology is the cerebral and mathematical aspects of the specialty. It's a perfect combination for someone who really likes to solve puzzles. A neurologist through a physical neurological exam is able to map out and identify what part of the neurological system is being affected in a person. Is the lesion in the brain, the spinal cord, the nerves, or the muscle? A neurologist could decide for this based purely on the physical exam. Another pro of being a neurologist is that your career never gets boring. You see a lot of very interesting cases, very challenging cases, that you wouldn't see, say, if you were a general practitioner who sees the common run-of-the-mill diabetes, hypertension. That reminds me of a book that inspired me to go into neurology called The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat by Oliver Sacks, who was a great neurologist. For those of you who are interested in pursuing neurology, you might want to check out this book. In the book, he describes various patients whom he took care of who had bizarre neurological disorders. The case that he named the book after described a man who had had a stroke in a specific region of the brain, which took away his ability to recognize faces. This disorder is called prosopagnosia. So this man would look at his wife and mistake her for a hat. In actuality, these cases are not so bizarre for a neurologist. Neurologists see these disorders all the time. Finally, the last pro of being a neurologist. We have the privilege to be there emotionally for patients during some of the most challenging times of their lives. It is hard, it can be challenging sometimes to gain the mental and emotional strength out of oneself to provide that for your patients, but if you do that, it can be a very rewarding part of your career. I've had patients give me hugs and tell me Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for explaining my really complicated diagnosis in a way that I can understand. So those are the pros and cons of neurology. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit the like button, subscribe if you haven't already subscribed, and please be sure to leave a comment below. We'll catch you next time.